Uh, I want to say an extra big welcome to all the folks that are here for the first time. We had a really great turnout um, in registration. There's a lot of you that are here for the first time, and we're so happy that you're here and that you're going to be a part of the community. This is a place for people of all walks, experiences, and stages of learning to gather and to better themselves and their communities um, and learn together and share our experiences. I'm really grateful to our community members that are coming back. We're happy to have you. It's your participation, feedback, and passion for learning that keeps this train rolling. So this space was made for us to work uh, and learn with the folks that we have the privilege of working alongside and being in community with, the systems that bring us up, the systems that bring us down, and to build a community, community where we all feel empowered by the knowledge and skills that we gain by sharing with like-minded folks who have similar and different experiences. So like I said earlier, this is being recorded. So if you would like to not be recorded, please turn your camera off so that you won't be included in that. Um, Today we're going to be covering um, opioid poisoning reverse training, and that's going to cover some myths, some stigma, some importance of language, and then we will do the actual training of how to reverse an opioid poisoning. Um, if you said yes, that you wanted a naloxone kit sent to you, we are currently a little bit backlogged, so you'll be getting that in mid-February, just so that everybody knows. It'll be a little bit delayed, but it will be coming to you. Um, so with that being said, we're obviously going to be touching on some very sensitive topics, some stuff that, you know, we've seen in the workplace, and it can be a little bit triggering. So if anybody gets a little bit overwhelmed and you need to leave, that's completely okay. You can pop out and we'll let you back in. Or if you need a little bit more assistance, you can send me a private message and I'm happy to talk with you or share some resources that might be able to support you better. I'm also here to help out with tech support. So we've written a quick how-to on turning on closed captions, but if you get stuck with it, don't hesitate to message us. Um, if you have any comments or questions about today's COP, you can also send me a private, private message and I'd be happy to chat. So being in community with each other means that we are being respectful and that we are being accountable with each other. So we'll be monitoring the chats to ensure that this remains a safe place for folks to um, express their ideas respectfully. Um, SJA has a zero tolerance policy for harassment, discrimination, or for demeaning behavior. So anyone engaging in those behaviors will be removed from the meeting and asked not to rejoin. So today we're going to be hearing from one of our own, Camille Balda. Uh, based in Toronto, Ontario, Cam is a bubbly Sagittarius who's been in the field for seven years. Incredibly passionate about harm reduction and poisoning awareness, Cam brings a unique mix of lived experience and professional experience to the team. In her role, you can find her running our Train the Trainer program as the National Facilitation Lead, training folks to be certified to teach opioid poisoning response training in their own communities. Cam can also be found doing community outreach and education at festivals and events across the country. So I'm going to hand it over to Cam now, and she will take over. Amazing. Thank you, Carly. What a lovely introduction. So hi, everybody. Uh, like Carly mentioned, my name is Camille Balda. I'm located in Toronto. And so I do want to preface that a lot of my knowledge comes from working outreach um, and working with community members here in the downtown core. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, this program is very near and dear to my heart as somebody with living and lived experience in regards to opioid poisoning. Um, it's so great to see such a huge turnout of people who want to support friends, family, community members, um, and making sure that everybody is safe and using as safely as they possibly can. Um, so let's hop into it. Carly, if you want to switch the slides. So like Carly mentioned, uh, we are going to be going over some sensitive topics. Um, I'm going to be giving as much of a content or trigger warning before hopping into slides that show drugs explicitly and before I start talking about how people use drugs. Um, and so I will be giving that heads up, but like they said, if anybody needs to step out um, or you know, take a break, go get some water, even just like bring their laptop or computer screen down um, or mute me, that's totally okay. And if folks need to debrief afterwards, we're always around. Um, and with that being said, we all come in with a different level of knowledge as well. And so I do wanna preface that no question is a stupid question as long as it's worded respectfully um, and we're engaging with the material that, we're, that I'm gonna to try to facilitate and teach everyone about. Awesome, so we're gonna hop in um, and first lay a foundation down before we even start talking about um, opioid poisoning reversals and what that medical emergency will look like. And the reason why we do this is so that people kind of remove some of the fear that has been um, pretty much ingrained in us since childhood, right? When we look at our education system, when we look at our media, all we see repeatedly is um, ways in which we can 
create fear around folks who use drugs and drugs themselves. And so by starting out with looking at drug stigmatization and harm reduction and some myths that float around in our society, we can really start to disassemble that, create new pathways in our brain um, in terms of what our beliefs are and, and look at the science aspect of it. And so that's why we like to start with that kind of foundation before we get into anything else. So here's a quote by Dr. Glenn Doyle, and I promise everybody I'm not a, presenta a pre presenter who reads off the screen. And so this will be the one and only time I do this, but I'm going to read this quote and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. So Dr. Glenn Doyle is a leading doctor in the States who looks at trauma and quote unquote addiction or substance use and dependency. And so he says, you don't just treat addiction, you end up treating anxiety, depression, PTSD, loneliness, rage, despair toxic secrets, regret, undiagnosed head trauma, untreated ADHD. Then you realize addiction is often someone's best attempt to cope when they don't see another option. And so this quote is great for a lot of reasons. Um, what Dr. Doyle is doing is pointing out that we're all comprised of so many different aspects as human beings, right? We have to look at humans holistically. We all have different intersections. People don't just have one part of them. We're not one dimensional. And so it's great to bring attention to the fact that people can have things both in their childhood, their teenage, their adult life that will lead them to potentially using drugs. But where it kind of misses the mark a little bit is that it looks at substance use and drug use in a way that is chronic and constant and dependent and chaotic. And that's not the case for all substance use, right? Sometimes we get really wrapped up in this whole, you know, addiction is a disease and an illness. And yeah, of course we can look at it from that aspect. But what we forget is that people have been recreationally using drugs since the dawn of time, right? We forget that alcohol, which is, you know, one of the most dangerous substances in the world, but it's legalized, we have a safe supply of it and people can engage with it in safer ways. Um, and so it's really important when we're disseminating quotes like this to understand that there are both positive and negative aspects of it. Things don't have to be as serious and as heavy as what we may think or what we might come into this course believing, right? There are so many different aspects of substance use. Someone can recreationally use opiates in the same way that they recreationally use alcohol or cannabis or tobacco or caffeine. Um, and so really looking again at humans being so incredibly unique and there's not one person who's like another is how we wanna start looking at opioid poisoning response. So the other half of this slide is looking at something called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And so when we look at ACEs, pretty much how we define it is when somebody's childhood deviates, again, air quotes from normalcy, um, whatever that may be. So that could be something like, you know, chronic bullying at school or the loss of a parent or abuse at the hand of somebody who's supposed to nourish and cherish that child. Um, and so when we see adverse childhood experiences, when it hits that threshold of being six or more, um, we can see as time progresses and that person turns into a teenager, a young adult, adult, that they're 46 times more likely to use injection drugs. And so when we're looking at any sort of kind of gateway drug, um, it's important to kind of clear our minds of what we've been fed by like, oh, cannabis is the gateway drug. And I actually see that trauma can be the gateway drug, right? It doesn't always have to be, um, but it does kind of set somebody on a path of like, oof, how am I gonna cope, right? How am I gonna cope with all of these experiences that have happened to me even before my brain has fully developed? Um, and so that's why, again, when we're laying this foundation, it's so important to realize that humans, it's not always a choice, right? Sometimes our coping mechanisms are things that have been instilled in us from our childhood in a way to just deal with the world at, that we're presented with. Um, and so again, Kylie, if you'd like to switch the slide over. <laughs> Amazing. So when we talk about systemic stigmatization, which is an incredibly difficult word to say, especially as somebody who has um, a new retainer in their mouth. So I apologize for all of the, the misspeaking on my part, but systemic stigmatization, essentially when we look at it, we're looking at how our society, so systemically, how we stigmatize individuals. Um, so what even is stigma? Stigma is essentially when we have an unfair label that's placed onto a group of people that strips them away of their individuality, of their humanity, you know, back to talking about in the previous slide, 
when we were talking about humans all being unique and having intersections and not being one dimensional. Um, when we don't understand things and when we're fearful of the unknown, we tend to place people in boxes. So we place people in these categories that our brain is trying to justify, okay, well, if they're doing this, they must be like that person. Um, even if it's just one shared behavior or activity or sexual identity or skin color, um, we place them into these boxes and it gets incredibly problematic, right? Because then you're just slapping labels on people who you don't know. Um, and so when we're looking at systemic stigmatization, um, it really influences so many different aspects of our entire being, right? From an, like a personal level, it's how you view other individuals, how you view humans, those thoughts and notions, those misconceptions. Um, and then we zoom out and we see, okay, societally, how are we viewing people? You know, what laws are in place to keep people marginalized? Um, how is our healthcare system working? How is our education system working? Um, and a lot of times when we're looking at marginalized groups of people, it's working against them, right? Repeatedly. Um, let's say you're a substance user. Going and getting health care is incredibly difficult. You know, I had a client who I was working with for years who repeatedly had the same symptoms over and over. And we repeatedly tried to get her support um, through the medical system. And they repeatedly were saying, oh, we'll just stop using drugs. That's your problem. Just stop using. Um, and it turned out she had cancer and she ended up passing away because she couldn't get access to health care because every single doctor that she came across was telling her, you just have to stop using, that's your issue. Um, and so again, those unfair labels that we're placing over people that is just a blanket statement um, can end up leading to death in, in really real ways, whether it's systemically or internalized, right? When we look at law enforcement, when we look at how people who use drugs and who have other different intersections um, and who are marginalized interact with law enforcement, right? People are losing their lives. And so stigma is real and it's prevalent and it's something that we have to disseminate each and every one of us because we all have our own misconceptions. We all have our own judgments. And so going forward, when we talk about things like language, when we talk about busting myths, um, when we before, again, we even get into this kit, it's so important to be real and honest with yourself. And it's okay if you use some of the language that we say not to use, um, but to try to create those new pathways in your brain so that you actively are making a change because that's where it starts. It starts with you. And then we build out and go and kind of try to abolish all of the systemic stigmatization that we have in our society. Great. I so we're gonna hop into some oh. Sorry, is it okay if I just ask a quick question? We are gonna do a question section at the end. So if you okay. can hold on to it or you can pop it in the chat so that our moderators can kind of keep a tally of who has questions, if that's all right. Okay, I've just I've had a brain injury, so it's hard for me to do certain things. So okay. that's why it's if it's possible to ask a question if you don't mind right now, is that possible? Um yeah, sure, we can do that okay. right now. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, have they ever put any kind of stats in Toronto or in Ontario that actually, so I'm, I work in the social services sector. I have mm -hmm. had a brain injury, so I've definitely, my life has changed for sure. Have they ever put any kind of stats on the population of people who are homeless um, because of uh, mental health or drug addiction or anything like that? Have they actually pulled like actual like real stats on this? Because I'm really curious to find out because people who are are from the system like the crown wood teammanship from 1980s a lot of people are homeless because of the system and it's just failed them right so mm -hmm. a lot of people are addicted to drugs and substances and things like that because of that as well you know so i'm just i'm just curious to know if they've actually like pulled the stats on like you know the digital population a generational alcoholism like there's a lot of different things right and so i'm just wondering about you know is there any actual like books or is there any actual kind of stats that show like you know, this is the reason why the population of homelessness is, well, is this actually like, you know, you hear people say, well, you know, if they weren't drug addicted, it wouldn't be a problem. They'd actually have housing. Well, no, it, it, it goes way further than that. That's not even part of the issue, you know, but it definitely adds to a lot of the issues that are happening. Right. So I work, sure. I work with, with HIV and stuff like that. So I'm very, I'm very understanding of people and, and what they've been through. So because I work in this population. So, mm -hmm. but I'm just, I'm, I'm always curious just to know if there's actual like stats about people who are like, homeless and because it's is it because it's drug addiction or is it a combination of both or is it a combination of just like they can't really figure out the system like is there any individual stats or any of this 
I'm sure there is off the top of my head. I can't think of any sort of scholarly sources or journals that have done um, intensive research on this, but I'm 100% sure there is. In Toronto specifically, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Zoe Dodd. Um, they're a really cool harm reduction activist. They did, they basically set up Moss Park and they're doing their um, masters at York right now. And I'm pretty sure that they did quite extensive research on the intersections um, between, you know, intergenerational trauma, substance use, experiencing homelessness, all that stuff. But I'm sure that we can pull up some sort of like Carly posted in the chat, they can pull up some sort of researcher stats and, and support you with that. That's a really great question. Thank you for asking. Um, okay, great. So let's hop into some myths. Um, so the first myth that we have here is drug decriminalization will increase drug overdose because it will be easier to find illicit drugs. Um, first and foremost, I think it's important to point out the, the difference in drug decriminalization and drug legalization. And of course, within the harm reduction realm, we would love to see decriminalization and legalization and having a safe supply. But the first step to get there is drug decriminalization. Um, and when we look at nations like Portugal, for example, who decriminalized all drugs in 2001, in July of 2001, um, what we see is not actually an increase in substance use. What we see is a decrease in um, blood uh, bloodborne illnesses, in abscesses, in HIV, in hep C, um, and we see, most importantly, a massive decrease um, in overall drug-related deaths, but more specifically, opioid-related deaths, right? Once people have, you know, kind of stripped the risk of incarceration um, from substance use and from, you know, them using drugs on a daily basis, trying to go get their next fix so that they're not in withdrawal, things like that. Um, we see people finding ways to access resources differently. Now, the really cool thing about Portugal is that they've decriminalized drugs. And what they've done is if folks are found with um, kind of an, a high amount of substances, and that can be you know, with intent to sell or distribute, um, trafficking, things like that, as opposed to being criminalized, what they do is they have folks connect with resources, right? With community agencies, with counselors. Um, and this is what we need to see in Canada, what we've kind of started to see a little bit in Vancouver, they're, they're decriminalizing drugs, but it's a really, really tiny amount. And we know that folks who use drugs have spoken up and said, hey, listen, we all carry way more than this. <laughs> like you're gonna need to up, up the doses here, um, but it's still, you know, off to a good start. We're off to an, an okay start. Um, and we've seen this in a couple different states as well. Um, but overall, drug decriminalization, it's similar to prohibition, right, with alcohol. When we saw people not having um, access to alcohol, what did they do? They made it themselves. You know, people were making hooch in their basement, and there was no real way to um, gauge the alcohol percentage. And so people were getting sick. People were dying from alcohol poisoning <clears throat> before prohibition ended. And as soon as it became, you know, legalized, regulated, there was a safe supply, there was a dramatic decrease um, in deaths related to it. And so that's what we want to see for all substances across the board, not just, you know, cannabis, not just alcohol, um, because we know that that's how we're going to keep our people safe and well. <clears throat> So myth two, so non-intravenous drug users don't have to worry about infections like hep C or HIV. And so while this myth kind of stems from a little bit of truth, overall, it is incredibly false. So what we do see with intravenous or intramuscular drug users is obviously you're using a needle. And so the risk of things entering the bloodstream is higher, especially if you're sharing your works, if you're using, you know, used needles or rigs. Um, but overall, you can still get these infections through sharing pipes, through sharing, um, you know, straws or any sort of apparatus for snorting. And the reason is that is when people are smoking, let's say meth or crack or even heroin through a pipe, the glass stem gets really hot, people's lips are chapped. If you don't have a tube to protect the stem, um, you know, you potentially are having cracked lips and blood on your stem and you're passing it over and sharing it with someone else and things are getting transferred that way. Um, in the same way with sniffing, right? If you're sharing, let's say a straw with someone and you have sores that are open in your nose because you regularly sniff, um, there's a little blood on the straw, it gets passed over, it enters the bloodstream. And so while the risk does decrease, um, it is still there. And so that's why we always recommend going to your local harm reduction agency, grabbing you know, unused gear. Um, if you absolutely have to share gear, 
trying to clean it, you know, with needles, there used to be the whole bleach thing. And while that doesn't eliminate everything, um, you can absolutely try your best to just make sure that you're keeping yourself and your friends, your family, your community members as safe as possible. Amazing. So myth three is if you only buy drugs from friends, you will get the pure stuff. And while, you know, there is some comfort in buying your stuff from, you know, a user that, or a, a drug dealer, a person who's selling drugs that you've been buying from for years, or a friend, or even a family member, there is that comfort in, oh, I know this person, they're not going to try to, you know, do me wrong. Um, that's also a misconception, right? People who sell drugs aren't necessarily trying to screw over their clients, right? From an economic standpoint, that's not going to go very well. That's not to say that all, you know, people who sell drugs have the best interest in mind of their clients or the people they're selling to. Um, but you really have no idea what's in any of the substances that you're pur purchasing unless you're handing a script into a pharmacy and getting pills back to you, right? We use the chocolate chip analogy a lot in this course. So this will probably be the first of maybe two or three times I say it. But let's say you have a batch of chocolate chip cookies. Um, you're throwing in your chocolate chips. You're mixing it about, popping it into the pan. You can't be sure how many chocolate chips end up in each individual cookie, right? There could be a chocolate chip cookie that has 10 chips. There could be a cookie that has one. Um, it's really just completely mixed up in there and you don't know. And it's the same thing when you are consuming substances that are from an unregulated supply, right? There could be one single grain of carfentanil in one pill that's coming from a batch where there's no carfentanil in any of the other pills, right? And it just takes that one grain to potentially be lethal. And so, yeah, okay, there's comfort again in trusting someone and, and buying your stuff from them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting the purest stuff. The only time you know that you're getting a completely not pure, but regulated supply, you know exactly what you're taking is if you're going to a pharmacy, if it is a prescription, right? And so I see in the chat, some folks are asking about where to purchase test strips. Um, a lot of times, at least in Toronto, if you walk into a community health center that has a harm reduction space, you can ask them for fentanyl testing strips. Fentanyl testing strips are amazing, but I will say, they detect if there's fentanyl in your substance, they don't detect how much, right? And so again, unless you're sitting in a lab testing each and every single pill, you don't really know the dose that you're gonna get. You don't know what's in it. You don't know what's in the next pill or the next pill, right? You could just get a bad pill. Your friends could be fine and carry on their day. Um, and so there is, there are a lot of systems, at least in Toronto, you could drop off, you know, your baggie, get that tested. But again, this is why we advocate for a safe supply so that everybody knows exactly what they're getting, the dose they're getting, um, and they don't have to, you know, risk a potential accidental poisoning. Amazing. So myth number four is supervised consumption sites or overdose prevention sites, normalized drug use. And so in a way, <laughs> This should, we, we should normalize drug use, right? Like drug use should completely be normal. Um, we've normalized alcohol use and, you know, caffeine use, sugar use, all of these substances um, that, you know, in some ways are as physically, uh, you can get as physically dependent as you can to opiates. Um, but in reality, a lot of folks are really, really worried that, you know, supervised consumption sites pop up all over the place, that we're telling everyone, oh, it's okay to, you know, constantly use substances or to risk poisonings. And that's not the case at all, right? Supervised consumption sites serve a very, very important, useful space in society. And that is to keep people safe while they're using. My first job in the field was at a supervised consumption site. And I learned more there than I have in the remainder of my seven years in the field. Um, it's the most grassroots, it's the most frontline you can get, and it's usually run by peers. So those are people who have living or lived experience, who use drugs, and who are there to keep people as safe as possible. And so when we talk about supervised consumption sites, both in an unregulated and regulated way, um, they are there to save lives, right? The amount of opioid poisoning reversals that have taken place in supervised consumption sites. I think the year that I worked at the one, if anyone's from Toronto, the Parkdale Community Health Center, um, we reversed something like, I think that one month there was 60 reversals of poisonings. And we did that in conjunction, naloxone in conjunction with oxygen, right? Or just sometimes even oxygen. And so when we're talking about harm reduction strategies and tactics, 
supervised consumption sites are at the root of it, right? We want to make sure that people are using in a space where they feel loved, where they feel cared for, where there's compassion and empathy. And they know that if they take a bit more than maybe what they're used to, that someone's going to be there and take care of them, as opposed to potentially using in a park or on the street alone and risking, you know, a potential fatality. Okay, so let's talk about some person first language. And so before we hop into this, you folks might have noticed that here at SJ, we use the term poisoning as opposed to overdose. Um, and there's a very deliberate real reason why we do that. And this is coming from, again, the frontline peer work, um, people who use drugs. And so this isn't a term that we've created or coined, but the poisoning basically takes the onus and the blame off of individuals um, who are using substances, right? When we say overdose, it implies that somebody has overdosed on their substance of choice. When we know that 97% of the time, poisonings are accidental. It's due to another drug finding its way into that person's drug of choice. Let's say that person wants to use oxy and you know fentanyl finds its way into their supply, or that person is using a completely different class of drug. They're using a benzodiazepine, so a Xanax, and there's carf fentanyl in there. Um, and their tolerance just isn't quite accustomed to that level or opiates at all. And they slip into a poisoning, right? Now, because we're talking about person first language, I'm also gonna pinpoint here that this first section here, so when we're talking about addict, user, drug abuser, junkie, former addict, if you have someone with lived experience sitting in front of you saying, no, I identify as an addict, that is completely their call, right? We're taking their lead on it. We have professionalized harm reduction and even social work as like this, this massive thing where a lot of times we think that the academic vernacular that we use is the correct thing for every single situation. Um, if someone is sitting in front of you and proudly saying, I am a former addict and I did this, 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 and this to you know remain sober, that's great. That's harm reduction for them, right? Um, when we say maybe use this instead of this, it's in terms of speaking to a wider group of people, right? It's the same thing with pronouns. If you don't know someone's pronouns, the safe bet is they them until they tell you different. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is really put the person before their substance use, before a behavior, before an action. Um, what I often say to folks is define addict for me. And they'll say, oh, somebody who uses drugs. Bam, perfect. Use that definition instead of that word, right? Person first. It's a person who uses drugs. But again, if they're identifying as an addict, a former addict, then that's, that's their thing. I remember when I came out to my parents as queer years ago. They were like, oh, you can't say the word queer. Oh my goodness, it's a bad word. And we had to have a conversation about taking back language, right? About finding power in that language. And it's kind of the same thing here in terms of the word addict. Overall, if you don't identify within that group, don't say it. Um, but if someone's telling you that that's how they identify, that's how they identify. All right, the next one is abuse. And what I always say in class is there's no need for the A and B, just drop them. The word is much too long. It's just use, it's substance use. Abuse has so much negative connotation. Um, when we think of abuse, we think of some really vile, graphic, horrific things when somebody is just using drugs, right? Um, and so again, we can just go with drug use. If somebody's using a drug other than how it's prescribed, again, they're using it how it's other than how it's prescribed, we've all taken, you know, more Advil than what's on the prescription bottle. We've all mixed Advil and Tylenol. Any of us who are on medication who also have an occasional drink or any of us who are on medication and sometimes forget that we can't drink grapefruit juice, right? These are all things that we're not supposed to do. And we do anyway, sometimes because we're humans. Um, and so again, we're not abusing any specific drug. We're just using it or we're using it other than prescribed. Um, clean intrinsically is not like a bad word, but it does imply the opposite, which is dirty. Um, when somebody says, oh, well, well, they're clean. Well, then what are the people who use drugs? Are they dirty? No, they're not. So testing negative, in remission, sober, not currently using drugs. These are all, again, take that word, define it in your head, and then use that definition. I know it takes a little bit longer and I don't expect everyone to be perfect at it just from jump. When we used, like when I first entered the field, um, I would say clean versus dirty for supplies, never really for humans, but for supplies. Um, and it took me a really long time to go from used to unused. Um, 
And it, again, it takes a minute, it takes a beat, but when you realize the impact that your words can have on an individual, um, it is paramount that we shift it, right? It starts with us, like I said before, when we're looking at systemic change, it starts internally. And so kind of taking the time and being like, oh yeah, hey, I did use that word, you know, let me correct it. Even if it's five minutes later, right? You're trying your best. Finally, we have habit here. So habit is an interesting one because it implies that this is a less serious thing than it is, right? It implies that for some people who are dependent on a substance or who use substances regularly, that they can just make the choice to stop, right? We can just all make choices to stop our habits. I pick the sides of my nails all the time when I'm anxious, I can just stop, right? It's not the same for substance use, especially regular substance use. It's gonna take a little bit of time. People physically are dependent on a substance. And so, saying habit kind of depreciates some of the like validity and how serious this can be for someone. So again, substance use disorder, drug use, easy peasy. All right, so harm reduction. I'm gonna have to limit myself on this slide because I could talk about harm reduction until the, the cows come home. It is my favorite thing to talk about. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, it's exactly how it sounds, right? Harm reduction is a way to reduce the harms for anything in life, for a behavior, for an action, um, for just being a human being, right? As a human, we engage with things that are harmful every single day. And so when we're looking at it outside of substance use, harm reduction can be something like brushing your teeth. It can be, you know, looking both ways before you cross the street. It can be my least favorite metaphor for her, or yeah, metaphor in harm reduction is like putting a helmet on or buckling in your seatbelt. It, it's a good one, but it's just so overused. But those are those are harm reduction strategies, right? When we look at substance use, um, harm reduction can be going to a bar and having a drink there instead of drinking alone in the park, right? Bars are supervised consumption sites. You got a bartender who's there to support you. You got people around you to make sure you're okay. And if you overconsume or slip into an alcohol poisoning, there's folks there who can who can support you who are trained for that. So harm reduction is essentially a way to meet somebody where they're at, right? It's taking that person's lead and understanding that they're the expert in their own life, not us. And so it's really important to note that harm reduction isn't a means to abstinence, right? Harm reduction isn't a pathway to say, oh, well, you know, if we support them, then they're not going to use anymore. No, no, that's not our goal. If that person, that individual's goal is to not use anymore, then great. That's fine and dandy. I love that for them. Um, we'll support them in getting there. But you can't bring your own preconceptions um, into this strategy, right? This is so just like taking that person's lead, being empathetic, meeting them where they're at, you know, unconditional care and support, irregardless of their sobriety. Um, and it can be like, hey, I'm noticing that, you know, towards the end of the month, you're running out of funds and you're slipping into little bits of withdrawal, which make you incredibly sick. How do we budget throughout the month to make sure that you can get your fix at the end of the month and you're not going to get sick? How do we pull things through, right? That's harm reduction. Again, just a way of engaging with somebody and meeting them where they're at. Great. So the Good Samaritan Overdose Act is uh, a really interesting piece of legislation. So it, it's, it's federal, it's all across Canada. And it was introduced really in 2016, but only kind of made publicly known in 2017. And it was brought forward by the government because what they were seeing a lot of times was folks unable, unwilling, scared to contact 911 because their friend was in a poisoning, but they had you know, their own legal things going on. They were recently incarcerated, they're on parole, they were carrying substances themselves. And, you know, realistically, what was happening was people were calling and the people who were calling were being reincarcerated. And so the government was like, people are incredibly afraid to place those calls. How do we support them? Okay, let's say that if they have a simple possession of any illegal substance that, you know, were they, they're covered under the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act. If they're on probation, if they're on parole, um, pretrial release or conditional sentencing in regards to possession of, of an illegal substance, they're fine. Um, and so a sim simple possession varies amongst different drugs, depending on where they're classified, depending on what schedule they fall in. Um, and so I recommend everybody taking a look at that if you're somebody you know who uses drugs and carries drugs on you. Um, now in, in theory, 
this act is great, right? It's like, let's protect the folks who are out there trying to help their friends, their family, strangers, whatever. Um, in, in reality, it doesn't always go that way, right? Folks are still being incarcerated. Folks are still, you know, being at the hands of police brutality. Um, there are a lot of areas in which we have to change and we have to reevaluate how we, how we view people who are engaging in substance use, who also might have recently been incarcerated because right now systemically those folks are still being marginalized and those folks are still being reincarcerated. Um, and so again, super important to know your rights. In your naloxone kit, there is a little sheet with a blurb around the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act. Um, and so, you know, knowledge is power and knowing your rights is incredibly important, um, but also know that it's not always covered. And for the folks who live in small towns as well, um, with anybody, I had clients who, you know, had active children's aid, child welfare cases, um, who found themselves in situations like this. And because they were in a smaller town, um, you know, cops know the CAS workers and word gets around and all of a sudden you've lost visitation. Um, and so I really recommend everybody doing, you know, research and looking into kind of what's going on in their own communities. Um, Cause again, knowledge is power. And if you know how to advocate for yourself, um, sometimes it can be the difference between life or death. Not saying that all the onus is on you. Systemically, we've got a lot of work to do, but knowledge is power. Right, so we're gonna hop into managing an opioid poisoning emergency. So in this section, um, not the next slide, but the slide after that, I am gonna be talking pretty extensively about heroin and fentanyl. We're gonna look at images of them. Um, we're gonna talk about how people use them. And so again, if this is something that's at all activating or triggering for you, um, pop the screen down, mute my voice, walk away, whatever you need to do. Um, we want people to leave today with like knowledge and power and feel like they can advocate for themselves and respond to this emergency. We don't want people to leave like re-traumatized. Okay, so what even are opiates? When we talk about opiates, it's important to acknowledge that they've existed for a very long time in, in medical settings, right? They've been used to treat severe pain. They've been used as anesthetic. There are kind of three main different types of opiates. There's a natural opiate, which is like heroin that comes from poppies. There are semi-synthetic, which are your hydro, so your hydromorphone, your hydrocodone, and those are mimicking that chemical structure of a natural opiate. Um, and then there are completely synthetic opiates, and those those ones are like heroin, or not heroin, sorry, fentanyl and carfentanyl, and they're completely synthetic, and so they can be made pretty easily in kind of in a laboratory or also just on someone's kitchen table. Um, and so when we talk about opiates, we often think, oh, like the illicit street treat market. But in reality, we have to acknowledge that they've been used in hospital and healthcare settings for a really long time, and they will continue to be because they're incredibly useful and work really well. All right. So here we've got a few different images. So we're going to start at the top with heroin. Um, and so those two powders you see there, the brownish powder is what is referred to as China white, and the white powder is pure heroin. So China white is um, basically a whole lot of fentanyl and a little bit of heroin sprinkled in there. And the pure heroin there obviously is what we know pure heroin to look like. Both these substances have kind of a grit to them when you touch them like drywall dust. Um, and heroin is pretty obsolete these days. Again, it's incredibly expensive to produce, takes a whole bunch of poppy seeds. Um, and so it doesn't really exist that much anymore. Um, and what is sold as heroin a lot of times is just kind of fentanyl with a bunch of fillers. Um, that second image there is black tar heroin. So when it's dry, it feels kind of like the inside of a crunchy bar. When it's melted down, it feels like a melted Tootsie Roll. And honestly, I only ever refer to drugs uh, in candy form because that is what I know best. So um, like, yeah, like a honeycomb toffee or a melted Tootsie Roll. Um, and then that final image there with the spoon and the needle is how folks most regularly uh, use heroin. And so oftentimes the substance is put onto a spoon or a cooker with a little bit of ideally filtered water, sometimes an acid to break the substance down, depending on its, what form it's in, um, and then injected or drawn up through a syringe with a filter on the end and injected usually intravenously, sometimes, uh, intramuscularly. And so that's heroin. The next strip of images, there's fentanyl. And so before we even hop into the three kind of different images that we have for fentanyl, it's really important to draw attention to how much, how many misconceptions there are about fentanyl. Um, the main one that's been perpetuated by media 
for the past few years is that touching fentanyl will slip you into a poisoning and you will die. Uh, and that's simply not the case. I'm somebody who has touched fentanyl. I don't even know how many times I've touched every color of fentanyl. I've touched it cooked down. I've touched it in solid form. Um, and I've never slipped into a poisoning. I've never even felt the effects of it. And so it's important to note that just touching it isn't going to do much unless you have, you know, a gash on your hand or unless you're touching it and then touching a mucous membrane. So eyes, nose, lips, genital. Um, I was told when I first started this job, it's like touching a hot pepper, right? You don't want to go in and touch those sensitive areas. Um, now, if you do touch fentanyl and you don't have PPE on, just wash with soap and water. Never use an alcohol-based uh, substance like hand sanitizer. Um, it can create micro abrasions on the skin, which are tiny little cuts, and then the substance can seep in that way. So just soap and water, easy peasy. Don't touch the eyes, the nose, the lips, the mouth, the genitals. Um, so that first image there that we have of fentanyl is in a vial form, and that's what most commonly you'll see in hospitals. You will never see that on the street. It's incredibly difficult to even get fentanyl in a hospital. Um, I was recently told by a nurse in one of our train the trainer sessions that before she retired, it took six people to sign out a single vial of fentanyl um, and administer it. And so that's not something that you'll traditionally see in the street. That second image there um, are transdermal patches. And so those patches, again, not really super common these days anymore. Um, they were used when I first entered in the field, they were used for chronic pain and some doctors and medical practitioners um, would prescribe these as a harm reduction strategy to folks who had been using substances for a really, really long time. who are finding that constantly looking for their next dose was interfering with their everyday life. And so those patches are cool. They have a 72 hour slow release. And so you stick them usually on the arm and you kind of go about your day. You don't have to worry about being in withdrawal. You, it just brings you to your baseline of feeling okay. Now, some other ways people would use it other than prescribed is by scraping the gel off and, you know, cooking it down and injecting it or chewing on the patch. Again, those are pretty obsolete these days. And I've gotten this question a few times, you know, this is one of the instances where if you touch the patch, you know, there is a risk of fentanyl getting into your system because those patches have, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny little needles. That's how they get through um, the dermis, so the skin. Um, but again, it's a 72 hour slow release. So if you touch it and you take your finger right off, you're usually pretty okay. Um, and then that final image there of pills um, is kind of just a generic image of pills because you never really know what fentanyl is going to be in or what it's going to look like. It comes in all different colors and sizes. Um, the colors don't really mean anything. It's usually just because it's created in, in the same environment as textiles. And so sometimes it's used as like a marketing tactic. Um, but usually it just, it's like, oh yeah, this was created and the dye seeped in and it is what it is. Um, and finally, that last little strip there is counterfeit opiates. And so we have some images that we pulled basically off of Amazon and AliExpress. Um, and those are just images of <laughs> pill making machines, capsule making machines. And so you just scrape the substance in there, you press down and you got your pills. And it's just to show how um, accessible it is to make the, these pills and how unregulated it is, right? If you're just scraping some powder and pressing down, there's really, again, back to that chocolate chip, right? You have no idea how many chips is in that pill. Okay, lethal doses. So um, before we even jump into this, it's important to note that lethal doses are incredibly personal to everybody, right? It is so centered on what your tolerance is. If you use substances, you know, if you've used substances for years and then had a, a patch of time where you don't use substances anymore, your tolerance is back down to zero. It's about your body composition, the way you metabolize drugs. It can even be down to your hair color, right? Redheads metabolize, um, substances like opiates differently than every other hair color. And so it, it's so personal. But if this is just, you know, like the average person, um, this is what can be can be fatal or lethal. So heroin, we've got about 30 milligrams. Fentanyl, we've got three milligrams and carfentanil a single grain. And so again, when we look at carfentanil, <clears throat> excuse me, which is traditionally used as a horse or elephant tranquilizer, um, that single grain can be lethal to someone. And so that single grain can find its way into one pill out of a batch of 20. Um, and so that's why we always say, you know, start low, go slow, especially, you know, if you're starting a new batch of something, if you're using a loan, call a friend, uh, go to a supervised consumption, say, use the national uh, overdose prevention hotline, um, all of these harm reduction tactics and strategies um, to, yeah, I can go over lethal doses again. So heroin is about 30 milligrams. Fentanyl is three, carfentanil is a single grain. 
And again, super, super personal, like everybody's going to be a little different with that one. Um, so yeah, that's kind of just the average. All right, so what even is an opioid poisoning? So if the only thing that you remember today from me is that an opioid poisoning is a respiratory system, depression or failure, then my job is complete because once you remember that it's the respiratory system failing, everything else is kind of common sense, right? It's common knowledge. It's like, okay, that person's not breathing. They haven't been breathing for a bit. What's your first line of defense to give oxygen? Um, and so basically when opiates enter the brain, they plug the receptors, um, they confuse the body, they release this natural, this high that mimics the body's natural happy chemical. So serotonin, dopamine, these are the chemicals you feel when you fall in love, when you get a job promotion when you achieve something really great. Um, and so they mimic those chemicals, but they also confuse the brain a whole lot. And they tell the lungs, Hey, don't worry about it. You can stop breathing now. Um, and so what naloxone does is it comes in there, it boots all of those opiates out, it plugs the receptors, um, and it prevents the body from ingesting any more of the substance for about 20 to 40 minutes. So remember that 20 to 40 minutes is really important. But again, an opioid poisoning, an influx of, of opiates in the system, it's going into all those receptors, confusing the body a whole bunch and telling the lungs to stop breathing. And that's when we get in trouble. So we're gonna go over some signs and symptoms of three different types of poisonings. Um, the first is gonna be a typical poisoning. And so that happens, that's kind of the traditional one that you see in media. And, and honestly, sometimes, you know, the Grey's Anatomy shows, the, CI, the CSI shows, they do kind of get it right in terms of what it looks like. Um, the after effects of responding to a poisoning, they always get wrong but what it looks like they do get right. And so for black indigenous people of color, um, you're gonna see a gray or purple lips, finger, fingertips and nails, um, sometimes toes. And what that is called is cyanosis. And so that is um, the blood not being oxygenated into, into the extremities, right? And so you got start getting a different color. Again, lips usually starts right on the inside, nail beds and fingers and toes. So for BIPOC, BIPOC folks, that's gonna be gray or purple for white presenting folks that is going to be a blue or a purple dark purple a little less ash tone um, and so it's, it's sometimes a bit more obvious as well um, the eyes are going to be tiny pinpoint pupils a lot of drugs really blow the pupils up for opiates it's going to be a really really tiny little dot if you're even able to see the eyes um, and then the body's kind of going to be the most obvious sign and so somebody's usually gonna be unconscious or on their way to being unconscious, you're gonna hear labored breathing. And so normal breathing is one breath every five seconds. As soon as it get, gets past that five seconds, it counts as labored breathing. So if there is really shallow breathing, so like <sighs> that's not a full breath. If it's super slow and again, past that five seconds, that's considered labored, labored breathing. You might also hear like a deep gurgling wet kind of sleep apnea type noise. Um, and again, that's that's the respiratory system failing and the body's gonna be just limp and, and usually unconscious. So that's our typical poisoning. When we move on to a dissociative poisoning, you're gonna see that same cyanosis that I said. Um, so, you know, lips, fingers, toes, but the body's not gonna be limp. Instead, it's gonna be really, really rigid, almost like the body is in rigor mortis or that person is experiencing a grand mal seizure without the seizing. So that wooden chest, the jaw is gonna be super tight, lips pressed over the teeth. Um, you might see veins popping out of the neck. Um, again, just the muscles are gonna be super, super taut. And that's because carfentanil and nitazines are incredibly strong. And so the body's muscles start reacting in an abnormal way. And so again, they're gonna have that labored breathing still going to be unconscious, but you can imagine CPR is going to be a little diff difficult and different in this case. And we'll go over that in a bit. And then finally, we have an atypical poisoning in that last column there. So an atypical poisoning is going to look the exact same as our typical poisoning. So that first one that I listed, um, and you're going to, you know, go through all the steps, you're going to administer the naloxone, and then that person is going to start breathing again, but they're not going to wake up, which is confusing. But the reason for that is that there are benzodiazepines introduced into the system. So benzodiazepines are completely different than opiates or a different class of drug. And so obviously naloxone isn't going to work on them. Um, and essentially what they do is they tell the nervous system to relax, right? They're usually prescribed for anxiety and panic disorder, sometimes for seizure disorders as well. And so they tell the circulatory system, so that's the heart to calm down. 
and opiates tell the respiratory system that they don't need to work. And so in conjunction, you have the heart and the lungs not working. And so obviously, you know, we're going to give the naloxone, the breathing's going to come back to normal, but their heart is still moving really slowly. And there isn't um, a medication that, you know, every person, the lay person who's not in the medical field can, can get their hands on to reverse a benzodiazepine poisoning. In that situation, you got to listen to dispatch and wait for EMS to get there. Sometimes they'll tell you to go get a defibrillator. Sometimes they'll say, just put that person in the recovery position, watch their breathing, and we'll be there soon. But those are our three types of poisoning. <clears throat> All right, so let's hop into when you first come on the scene. I have to take you... a screenshot of that last. Pardon? And for anybody who's like hoping to, you know, get the slides or something, Carly, I'm not sure if we're sending the slides out to folks. We are? Okay. So no worries about if you like need to take notes or if you miss something, um, the slides. Carly will send them out to all of you folks. Um, so you are seeing um, a someone experiencing a poisoning. And so you're seeing even one of those signs or symptoms um, and you're gonna go assess the scene. And so in the same way that you're gonna do for your first aid CPR, you're gonna make sure that the scene is safe for you and for that individual before you approach. And so these are some of the things that you might see um, before entering um, to go actually start the rescue that you need to be aware of. Survival pets, this is a really scary image and I feel like they get a bad rep, but a survival pet, especially for someone who is experiencing homelessness or more street involved is someone's companion, right? That is their best friend, that is their, their person. And so when you're approaching a scene as a stranger and there's somebody down potentially, that survival pet is just trying to protect their person, right? Essentially like their parent. Um, and so approaching with compassion and kindness, also making sure that you keep yourself safe, right? If there's another community member there who knows the animal a bit better, maybe taking it off to the side, grabbing some water. If there's a leash, tying it up as best as you can so that you can you know, go and respond to the casualty. Um, but again, if it's not safe for you, you gotta keep yourself safe. You're not gonna be helpful to anybody if you're injured as well. You might see bodily fluids, pipes, sharps, or drugs. Um, in this case, you know, always making sure you have your PPE on you. One of the first mistakes I made in the field is I did a safety sweep at eye level and not at the floor. And I went down to do CPR and right under my knee, a crunch of a pipe. And it was not fun and it hurt. And so what I recommend, you know, look at the floor, take the time. You never see paramedics running onto a scene. Why is that? Because they're assessing it first, right? Do your first sweep, make sure everything is clear, kick things away if you need to grab your gloves, put them on as you're doing this, this assessment. Um, and then finally, community members, you might see folks there who um, are trying to help their friend or who are even saying, hey, don't give them naloxone. Ultimately, they're doing that to try to mitigate any of the withdrawal symptoms that their friend might feel. And so getting people involved, right? People who use drugs know a lot better than us how to administer the naloxone, getting them involved or asking them, hey, why don't you go grab some water? Your friend's going to be thirsty when they wake up. Just Again, approaching the scene with compassion, kindness, understanding, all of that fun stuff. So in your emergency kit, this is something that, you know, we recommend folks to have on them, but you might not, and that's okay. Um, first and foremost, your naloxone kit. Um, folks are gonna, the folks who said that they wanted naloxone kit, you'll get sent to, again, probably mid-February once every, the backlog is filled. Um, your phone, if you have, you know, an iPhone, a really handy dandy trick, if you're responding to a poisoning alone, is to activate, I'm not going to say the word, because I don't want everyone's phones to go off, but S-I-R-I, -I. you could say, hey, that word, you know, call 911 on speakerphone, or set a timer for two to three minutes, especially when you're alone, having the option to be hands-free is super, super valuable. Um, an extra pair of gloves. The gloves that come in our kit are large. And so, you know, sometimes it's helpful when I worked frontline, there were always gloves in my back pocket, a trick I learned super early because you never know when you're going to need an extra pair. A roll of tape, which I unfortunately ran out of tape uh, from my last class, but pretend that this is a roll of tape and this is the sticky side. The reason why we tell folks to bring a roll of tape is you can press down onto, you know, pipes, onto rigs, onto anything press down, pick up the sharp and move it aside so that you don't have to touch it um, if that's not something that you're comfortable doing. Uh, and then finally, my favorite and funniest point, don't wear sandals. Again, if you're going onto a scene where you're expecting to see poisonings or substance use or anything, yeah, wear closed toe shoes. But if you're walking to the store in the summer, going for a stroll to the park, down the beach, and you're in sandals and you have none of these things, you can still respond to a poisoning. 
Awesome. So what is even in your kit? So um, you've got ooh, the hard shell. Mine is open. Of course it is. Um, so again, you can throw this at the bottom of your bag. You're good to go. Um, two doses of nasal naloxone. So our nasal naloxone looks like this. You'll notice it has a red plunger, which is the new formula. Um, and so basically with the new formula, if, if yours has a white plunger, it's still completely good and viable to use. It just has a different temperature range in which it can withstand. Um, and so this one, ideally it won't go over 40 degrees, but it can withstand up to 40 degrees down to negative 15 because below negative 15, it'll freeze. So just being aware of that. A pair of non-latex gloves, you've got your breathing barrier, which I'll go over when we're looking at how to respond to the poisoning. Um, and that card that I noted before, um, that will tell you, you know, you write in your name, expiry, date issued, and then on the back of it, you'll have your Good Samaritan um, drug overdose little blurb that you can go over. Um, and then there's also the thing that I dropped as the kit came out, but there's a sheet that goes over our save me steps. Um, and so ideally, you're not going to whip this out mid poisoning, um, because you're going to look at it every other night for 30 seconds, because repetition is how we build pathways in the brain. Um, but it goes over our save me steps. It's like, you know, literally a 30 second read. And if you do that, you know, once a week, you'll kind of get into uh, the rhythm and flow of how to respond to a poisoning, even if your body's not accustomed to it. Lisa asks, what's the tape for? The tape is just to pick up any sharps. So you put the sticky side down, tap on the sharps, move them aside for anyone who missed that. Okay. Perfect. So we're going to get into how to actually administer the naloxone. Um, and so it's super, super easy. Um, we're going to go over this step a couple of times within the rescue, but all you have to do is get your naloxone. There's going to be a little tab here, almost like a yogurt. Uh, you peel it back, take your naloxone, place it between two fingers, whichever two fingers are most comfortable for you. And one finger on the plunger. You're going to place it into the nostril, having the tops of these two fingers hit the bottom of the nostril and you push. That's it. Um, there is one dose in here, so do not press it prematurely. Make sure you get an actual nice seal in there, press it. Um, and that's pretty much all you need to know. We're going to go over all the other steps of the rescue. Um, but if you, again, only really remember that, it's enough to, to potentially save someone's life and reverse the poisoning. So some complicating factors that we're going to get into before we go into the save me steps, um, because things can go wrong or things cannot work. So if the naloxone doesn't appear to be working, there could be a variety of factors that are at play here. It could be that that person actually has no opiates in their system, um, which again, you know, there are different drugs that mimic kind of an opioid poisoning. Sometimes benzos look that way. Um, sometimes somebody who's in diabetic shock looks that way. Um, there's a lot of different things that could be happening, but it's important to note that naloxone does no harm. Um, if somebody is not in a, like an opioid poisoning, it does nothing. And so you can give this with the reassurance that it's not going to harm anyone. It won't do any good if there's no opiates, but you're safe. Um, it could be that somebody has ingested a lot more opiates than one single dose is going to take care of. And in that case, you go through your safe me steps a few times until that person uh, is back breathing or EMS gets there. It could be that you got there, you know, a little bit later and that person's heart has stopped beating. And so obviously it can't penetrate through the blood brain barrier, get into the bloodstream and head into the brain. And so in that case, you know, you're going to really want to hop into your CPR again, just listen to dispatch. Um, it could be that there is a nasal blockage. And so I'll show you a really quick trick to clear that up. And it's important to note that you only ever want to do this when there is another individual with you who can support with the rest of the rescue. So giving those rescue breaths, because again, it's respiratory system failure. So this is called an ethmoid sphenoid massage. And all you got to do is take a finger to the nose in which you're going to administer the naloxone. Again, this is if some, if you've administered doses in either nose and the medication comes leaking out, um, that means there's a blockage in both sides. So you're going to pick a nostril, apply firm pressure, take your other finger, and apply pressure to where basically the top of the cheekbone meets the eye socket for about 30 seconds, and then sweep across for 30 seconds and down for 30 seconds. After that, there's hopefully gonna be some movement. You might see some, some mucus or snot come out, and then you could try to read administer the naloxone in that nostril. Um, it could also be that this is frozen. You stick it under the armpit, let it heat up, and then get going with 
the rescue. If you are um, responding to a child or infant who's in an opioid poisoning, the only difference in the entire rescue is you leave the applicator in for an additional 15 to 20 seconds. Um, now, somebody can be semi-conscious and refusing naloxone, so they could be on the nod, so nodding in and out of consciousness, and if somebody is refusing naloxone and they're able to communicate that to you, then you are taking their word for it and you are not giving them naloxone. Now, if that person ends up slipping into a state of being unconscious, into a poisoning, you have implied consent, um, but you are taking that person's lead on it. It could just be that they're really high and they know that they're going to bounce back. Um, they're probably trying to avoid precipitated withdrawal, which is the most uncomfortable feeling in the entire world. Um, it, I've been told, is worse than a heart attack and childbirth combined. And so when people are saying that they are trying to avoid that because it feels like they're dying, it's because they, they feel like they're dying. So please, please um, don't try to negate the seriousness of that. Um, if somebody is refusing naloxone, you can say, okay, I'm just going to be down the hall. Um, you know, is it okay if I keep an eye on you or I'm going to leave my naloxone kit with your friend? Um, just again, just trying to be empathetic. Um, let them know that you're there because you care about them and you don't want to see them hurt. Um, and finally, somebody could wake up and immediately flee the scene. Um, someone's flight, flight, freeze, or fawn can be activated and they know that, you know, uniforms are on their way. And so what they want to do is to try to mitigate some of that re-traumatization and get out of there. Um, if that is the case, you know, trying to educate them and say, hey, like the naloxone could wear off in 20 to 40 minutes. Can you take my kit? Or can I have EMS, you know, come check on you in a little bit? Like I'm worried that you're going to slip into another poisoning. And ultimately just trying to again engage with that empathetic, compassionate side that everyone on this call definitely has. Uh, make sure that that person knows that you're there for them. Perfect. So the last part of this training, let's get into the steps of the save me rest of the opioid poisoning response. So we're going to use the mnemonic save me. Um, and so Kylie, if you want to go into the next slide. Perfect. So save me is comprised of a few different steps. The first is stimulate. Um, and so we're going to get into each of these steps in detail. I'm just going to go over them really briefly right now. Um, so obviously we want to try to rouse that person before we even start the rescue. Next is airway. So, you know, your gloves are going to be on head, tilt, chin, lift, ventilate one breath every five seconds, making sure the chest rises with each breath. Then you're going to look and see, okay, is this helping? Honestly, probably not going to help. So you're going to move on to Medicaid, which is administering the naloxone, that peel, place, press, um, doing CPR for two to three minutes, evaluate again, is that person breathing? If so, recovery position. If not, we're repeating that all over again. So let's hop into stimulate. So this is done after you have done your safety sweep, your gloves are on, you're getting ready to move in. This is gonna happen really fast. So verbally, you're gonna to try to rouse that person. Hey buddy, hey friend, using you know gender, non-binary gender words, like instead of sir or ma'am, just be like, dude, I use dude a lot. People are good with it, don't stress. Dude, friend, buddy. Uh, if you know their name, say their name. Um, if they're not responding to that, say, I'm going to give you naloxone. I can assure you if that person is just high, they're going to, they're going to tell you no. Um, you could say, I'm going to call 911. What I like to say is I'm going to call for medical first responders. So that is what I'm going to do. 911 can sometimes be triggering for folks. If none of that works, you're going to try to physically stimulate them. So that could be, you know, rubbing the knuckles on the clavicle right here, never on the sternum. We know that potentially can cause heart arrhythmia, um, tapping the foot applying firm pressure where the jaw and the ear meet it's really painful and pinching the back of the arms again this is going to happen super super fast you want to make sure that you're going one after another um, so after stimulating the casualty if they're not responding you're going to hop in and call 911 immediately um, and so when we call 911 it's important that we are checking ourselves and our judgments and our preconceived notions um, and really just being factual and making sure that we're giving the dispatch the exact information that they need. Carly, do you wanna switch the slide for me? Sorry, thank you. Um, so you're telling them exactly where you are. If you know that your building's front door is always locked, but the side door is always open, that's what you're gonna tell them. Um, every sign and symptom that you're seeing, again, unless you're a medical professional, we're not here to diagnose the issue, unless you know that the specific drug they took, you're not going to take a guess, right? You're going to say, I'm seeing, you know, cyanosis, I'm seeing labored breathing, all of the things that you're factually seeing. Um, if there are, are drugs present and you did see that person using drugs, you can say that um, I suspect a drug poisoning happening. What you don't want to say is overdose. What we've seen in the field is that that kind of bumps people down a little bit on the list of, uh, 
what of, of when EMS gets there. And so saying there's a drug poisoning happening can potentially elicit a quicker response and where you are in the process of administering the naloxone. If you came onto a scene and someone's already given two doses, but they forgot to call 911, let dispatch know that, right? EMS is gonna need to know that when they come on and they, they need to gauge where that person's at in the rescue. Um, and so again, we're trying to stray away from all of those stigmatizing words that we previously talked about. Um, we really don't wanna you know, incite a police response because this is a medical emergency. We don't need police there. And we know that once police arrive, the situation can get a little volatile. Um, and people who have been traumatized by law enforcement in the past can be triggered, right? And that's when we see that fight response usually. It's not normally when, you know, you're just a regular person in clothes walking around trying to trying to help out your community members. Um, it's usually when people see that re-traumatizing uniform. So that person is unconscious, how can they be aggressive, right? We're not saying that that person's aggressive or violent. We're just saying what we're seeing, exactly how we're seeing it in real time. So the next step, <clears throat> sorry, my throat. So we're gonna do the rest of the Amy step. So after we've called 911, we might still have them on speakerphone. We're gonna check their airways. So like you learn in CPR, head tilt, chin lift, making sure there is nothing blocking that airway because we're about to give some ventilation. So that's where this, wonderful piece of plastic comes in handy that I'm holding upside down. And so the really cool thing about our, um, our one-way valve here is that it shows you exactly how to place it on someone's face, exactly where to pinch the nose and how to tilt the chin, all of that stuff. And so if you've never taken CPR first aid before, don't stress, it's on here. And so what we're gonna do is give one breath every five seconds, making sure that the chest rises with each breath. You don't wanna do an aggressive breath um, because that could end up having that person vomit, which nobody wants to see. Um, and I also do just have to acknowledge that, you know, we're still living in a COVID environment, unfortunately, and we know that COVID is transmitted through droplets from the mouth. And so we've done our research, we've vetted medical teams and our curriculum team, and we know that giving ventilation is imperative to a rescue. Um, but again, this isn't to supersede your organization's protocols or procedures. We don't want anyone to get in trouble. You know your health the best. We know that it's pretty imperative to the rescue to give that ventilation. But if you absolutely can't, what you're going to do is, is do chest compressions. You're going to hop, you're going to do your naloxone first and then your chest compressions um, until EMS gets there and they can start with the ventilation. Um, so after ventilation, you're going to evaluate, did any of this help? You know, back in the day, sometimes oxygen was enough, not so much anymore. Um, and so then we move into uh, the Medicaid step. Um, perfect. So again, I told you guys, we're going to go over this a few times. So again, that peel place press. So you peel back your naloxone, place it between your two fingers into one nostril push, and then start your CPR for two to three minutes. And up next, we have a video from Mark Barnes, which is our partnering pharmacist. He is located in Ottawa, Ontario, where all of your kids are gonna be coming from. Um, he's a great advocate in the pharmacology realm for harm reduction and nasal naloxone. And we're gonna to listen to him repeat everything I just said because he's a medical professional and this is how you get your certification. So Carly, if you'd love to play Mark. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark Barnes pharmacist and founder of RespectRx Pharmacies in Eastern Ontario. My focus has been on harm reduction and the at-risk communities for the last 10 years. I have partnered with St. John Ambulance Canada for the Naloxone Training and Distribution Program to help share information on how to manage the overconsumption of opioids. The first step is to call 911 and get EMS on their way. Next, you will lay the person on their back and provide ventilation for your casualty to get air to their brain. Give five breaths to your casualty, ensuring their chest raises with each breath. Your instructor will provide you with more details about that step. Now you will open your naloxone kit and get to work. Remove the nasal device from the package. There is only one dose per device in the package and it's ready to use. Do not test or prime the device in any way. Tilt the person's head back and support their neck with your hand. Gently insert the tip of the nozzle into the nostril. Your fingers should be right up against the nose. If you're administering naloxone to a child, make sure the nozzle seals the nostril. Now you press the plunger firmly with your hand to give the dose, then remove the nozzle from the nose. So a quick review. Number one, call 911 and get EMS on the way, then lay the person on their back. 
provide ventilation for your casualty, and make sure you give them five breaths. You will know you've been successful if you can see their chest raise with each breath. Support their neck with your hand. Take the nozzle, insert it into the nose, and press the plunger firmly. You may need to use two or more doses depending on the situation, but your instructor will go into more details now. Thank you so much for taking this training. Back to your instructor. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Such a soothing voice. So after you've administered your nasal naloxone, like I said, you're going to hop into two to three minutes of CPR, and that's going to feel like the longest two to three minutes of your life. But it is really, really important that we take that time because that's how long it takes for the naloxone to permeate through the blood brain barrier, get into the system and start doing its thing. With a lot of um, poisonings that we're seeing nowadays on the streets. Um, it is going to take more than one dose of naloxone realistically. And so you're going to repeat that step and you're going to keep repeating it. Uh, so naloxone CPR, naloxone CPR, um, until that person starts breathing again. So in that case, you put them into recovery position until EMS gets there and they can take over or until you run out of naloxone. And if you run out of naloxone, you're just going to do CPR until first responders get there. Now, signs that the naloxone is working is that person is going to, their cyanosis, so that discoloration of the lips, the fingertips, and the toes is going to return to normal. They're going to breathe again, that one breath every five second kind of rhythm. Um, their pupils will come back to normal size. They'll start waking up and they might start experiencing withdrawal. And so it's really important, again, to note that withdrawal is incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable. Um, it feels like your bones are breaking, bugs under your skin. Uh, like you're vomiting, and but you like can't keep food down. You're exhausted, but you can't sleep. Your head is pounding. It feels like your 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 head is being split open. It is incredibly uncomfortable. And so, what I want to emphasize to everybody is, if somebody is waking up and they're saying that they feel like they're dying, it's because they feel like they're dying, right? Um, so that's the one negative aspect of of naloxone is that that person is going to be put into into withdrawal. And so this can bring up a lot of emotions. Like I said before, um, there's this big misconception that people are going to wake up and they're going to start swinging. And that's just not the case. In my entire time working frontline reversing, I don't even know how many poisonings. Um, I've never had an individual be violent with me. Um, and, you know, there is both privilege and not so much privilege in being a five foot one female in downtown Toronto. Um, and so it's not to say that if you know, you're know you approaching in a uniform that that might be a different experience, but most of the time people are you know incredibly fearful. They were literally on the brink of death and brought back. Um, they're confused, they're scared, they're feeling guilty. What I like to say to folks when they wake up is, hey, I've been here for X amount of time. In that time, no one has touched you other than me. And that was, you know, here to give you naloxone and here to give you CPR. Um, your stuff has been right beside me. Nobody has taken anything. Um, I'm, I'm right here. I'm here to help. I'm here to support. If they tell me to back away, I back away, I give them space. Um, but again, just approaching with that, that compassion and empathy that, like I said, you all have and why you're here. Um, so yeah, just those misconceptions, throw them out the window. It's not, it's not reality. Okay, so we're gonna just review the steps. So again, you're doing your safety sweep when you first arrive, you're gonna stimulate the casualty. So that is verbally, physically, you're gonna call 911, again, being super factual, um, not letting any stigmatizing language and flow through that phone call. Um, airway, so your gloves will be on, you're gonna do the head tilt, chin lift, five breaths, one breath every five seconds, making sure that chest rises. Take a look, is this helping? No, okay, let's go on to, to the naloxone. You're gonna peel, place, press. Um, do CPR for two to three minutes. If that doesn't do anything, you're going to repeat um, that step again. And like I said, wait for, for EMS to get there, which hopefully will be sooner rather than later. Great. Perfect. So um, get a kid, save a life. So throughout Canada, um, federally, we all have different availability and access to naloxone, which really is unfortunate. Ontario, Quebec, and the Northwest Territories are the only three provinces and territory in which you can get nasal naloxone free of charge. Um, luckily, we have this program running. Um, and so anybody who wants naloxone is going to get naloxone, nasal naloxone, um, and not have to pay for it at their local pharmacy. Um, that's to say, that's not to say that you can't go and get intramuscular. I know we didn't train on that today, but if you hop into your pharmacy, intramuscular across Canada is free. Um, you can get a little brief training there. All of the things that we said today can 
be replicated in terms of the destigmatization, the, you know, aftercare after the save me steps, all of that stuff. Um, but obviously the administration is going to look a little bit different. And that is the end of that part of the presentation. I know I went over time a little bit there, so I apologize. I'm going to eat into the question section. Um, but Carly, I think we're going to take a little, a little break and then come back and do some questions. Yes, that is correct. Um, so I'm going to post a quick survey on the screen. If you guys could take a couple minutes to fill it out, it's completely anonymous. I don't know what you're saying. It's just the information that we're gathering. Um, and then we will regather at 225 so that we can jump into some question and answer with Camille.
All right, everyone, welcome back. Um, we're going to resume things now. Um, so if anybody has any questions for Camille that they would like to ask, um, please like raise your hand physically or, you know, on. Um, or if you don't have you can just drop them into the chat. Cheryl, I see that you are looking to ask a question. Uh, if anybody has a question for the Carly, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I can't hear you. No. I'm assuming you're just saying, does anybody have any questions? And if so, I can pop in the chat and check it out um, until your mic gets back up and working. Um, doo -doo -doo. Or if anybody wants to take themselves off mute and ask a question, feel free to do that as well. Um, Alana, did you see any questions as the training was going on in the chat? I did, and then my computer crashed, and I had to restart it, and now I lost Iconic. all of it. So. We love technology. No problem. <laughs> okay. okay, let's see. Here also, we go. Oh. <laughs> go ahead. We're getting some. Um, can you hear me now, Kim? Yeah. Great. Wonderful. So what I said to everybody was, welcome back. Uh, we're going to jump into the Q&A now. Sorry that my uh, headphones stopped working. My Zoom crashed. Um, so we are going to be able to ask questions. So if you want to ask a question, you can physically raise your hand. I will see you do that. You can raise your little Zoom hand. Um, I will also see that. Or you can unmute yourself and ask the question to Cam. Uh, if you're not comfortable asking the question out loud, please feel free to drop it in the chat or private messages to me and we can read that out loud. Um, so we had someone ask, David asked, should an AED be used during an opioid poisoning? Um, that's really, really contingent on the individual. Um, it depends on, like I said, if there are benzodiazepines being introduced into the system that are causing the circulatory system to be repressed. Um, I'm not a medical professional. I know a lot about drugs and about opioid poisonings, but I can't necessarily give you medical advice. Um, but your best bet is to stay on the phone with dispatch. And if that is what they're advising to do, then that's what you do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, really specific to the individual and the drugs they've consumed and their own potential uh, health history. But there's usually no harm in grabbing one as you're on the phone with 911 if you have another person responding. We had uh, Kendra ask, what provinces give free nasal naloxone? 
So that would be Ontario, Quebec, and the Northwest Territories. You also, if you're under the non-insured health benefit plan, so if you're an Indigenous person who um, is registered, you can get one nasal naloxone a month, I believe in uh, BC and Alberta, but there have been some negative interactions that folks have had accessing nasal naloxone that way. Um, and so you can always reach out to us if you're facing any barriers. Jill said an agency um, I work with has a policy that only uniformed employees, uh, so firefighters, EMS, et cetera, are allowed to administer naloxone due to the fear that individuals may be violent when they come to from, from the naloxone. Mm. It's just, just rooted in fear. And how do we encourage policy change? Well, it's super interesting because it's almost a negative spiral there that they're, that they're going under, right? You're putting somebody who's been, you know, oppressed and, and marginalized by a system. So those first responders, usually specifically police, but um, there are some negative interactions that happen um, with EMS and with fire as well. And you're saying, oh, those are the only people who are able to respond. And so obviously people are going to be re-traumatized and triggered. Um, and so that is a huge systemic battle, like fight that you're up against there, Jill. I mean, I would recommend for the folks who are instilling that policy to take our course. Um, ideally, then they would have some sort of knowledge and um, like honestly science to back up the fact that that doesn't happen. You can also let them know that I think amongst our team, there's something wild, like 70 years combined of experience in the field. And we can count on two hands, all of us together, the amount of times that folks have, have come out swinging. Like it is just this really big fear-based thing that the media perpetuates. And again, happens more often with police because people are generally trying to protect themselves um, and stay alive. So uh, encouraging policy change is difficult. I worked at a shelter that was really, really far behind and it took years. It took Toronto Public Health. It took the works um, to get them up to a speed where they weren't just discharging folks for substance use on site. And so it is a slow, tedious uh, climb up, but you can get there. Um, that seems like it could be like a, a conversation that you and I have, or even someone else on the team, I, I've worked with a couple of folks who have been trying to pass policy through their agency. And so if you want to connect outside of this and talk more specifically about what that looks like for your agency, um, I'd be really happy to connect with you on that. Thanks, Cam. Uh, Madeline asked, um, so you said that they, if they refuse treatment, we cannot give it to them. Does that apply if they slip into an unconscious state? No, so you have implied consent there, right? If that person is now unconscious, you are covered by both, you're covered by the Good Samaritan Act in general um, in responding to that poisoning and consent kind of goes out the window in that case because you're saving a life. And Marsha, oh, do you have Marcia. a question? Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to find the hand. Yeah. Um, this might be a silly question, but I'm actually a first aid instructor. So this is how my brain works. Um, why, can you explain to me what, why you give the five breaths, five seconds Absolutely. of first? Um, Cause it's a little different than we normally teach for when you're unconscious, we start with compressions. Um, can you explain that to me? Cause that'll make, help me remember. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely right. So the most the most basic way that I could put it is that that person is in respiratory distress, right? They've been down for we don't know how long, yeah. and we know within that three to five minute window, permanent brain damage, organ damage, all that stuff. And so mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we're getting those breaths into the system to help negate some of those negative side effects of not having oxygen. Um, and so that's kind of the main crux of it. Um, and we also want to make sure that person, yeah, again, is not going to experience yeah. permanent brain damage. That's basically why why we do it because we know it's okay. a respiratory system failure from the okay top, right okay from the top that makes sense yeah. to me now thank you very much <laughs> awesome of course no problem thanks marcia so david asked is it prefer preferable to alternate giving nasal and injectable naloxone when both are available and when multiple doses are administered is one more effective than the other i mean okay so it kind of depends your level of comfort with either route of administration. I am somebody who personally prefers intramuscular because I'm able to almost microdose it in a way to just get that person's breathing back so that they're not in really intense precipitated withdrawal from the naloxone. Um, there's not really much to say as, as like 
to alternate between the two. I would say alternate between nostril if you're giving pure nasal. Um, but if you're, you know, running low on your intramuscular and you have a nasal, go like you, you can use them in conjunction. They're the exact same medication, uh, slightly different doses, mostly because of the route of administration and everything that the nasal has to go through to get into the bloodstream. Um, but I wouldn't say that you, there, it's not preferable to alternate really. It's kind of, you're doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Jasmine asked, when administering naloxone, should I be blocking the other nostril? Um, no, it's not necessary. I mean, if you administer a dose and there is medication coming out of the other side, which is super rare, it could be that that person has um, a hole within the cartilage of their, their nasal cavity um, from snorting substances. That is a possibility. I've seen that maybe one time. Um, but yeah, you don't normally have to block the other nostril if you are noticing that there that that's happening. Um, you can, I don't know if it's going to help very much. You might want to go straight into IM, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's not necessary to block the other nostril. This is a question from me. Um, can you talk about, uh, naloxone and pets? I know that there was a problem in the summer with, uh, some pets stepping on some needles in right. Toronto. And I was wondering yeah. how that works. <laughs> yes, I can talk about that. So we've done pretty extensive research. Actually, I think Alana was part of that research. So Alana, if I get anything wrong, feel free to jump in. Um, but I'm pretty sure what we ended up finding out is that naloxone can be used on animals. They just metabolize it quicker than humans. And so that 20 to 40 minute window in which we are kind of like safe um, is much shorter for them. I think it was somewhere between five to 10 minutes. And so if you have the naloxone, you think your dog is in an opioid poisoning, administer it, try to get to an emergency vet as quick as you can, because they are going to metabolize that quicker. Alana, did I miss anything? <laughs> it's good. Okay, great. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Leanne asked, uh, she said, I work in a rural area and travel from community to community in a vehicle. What is the lifespan of a kit if stored in a glove compartment? Um, so regarding extreme heats and cold weather. Yeah. So, I mean, with the new one that all of you are going to get, it can be frozen and thawed a million times and it has no, like, it's not going to decrease the effectiveness of the medication with the old one, with every 50 cycles of being frozen and thawed, it would lose about 15% of its effectiveness. Um, in terms of high heat, it does lose a bit of its effectiveness, but not a whole lot. And, and that's above 40 degrees. And so it's gotta be pretty hot where you're at. Um, what I recommend if you're able to take it out of the glove box and bring it in with you or throw it in a backpack, that's kind of best practice, but it can be left in your car. Um, and in terms of <clears throat> lifespan, I, I forgot to mention this in the training because I kind of ran out of time and zipped through it, but um, naloxone expires technically about two to three years, um, but it doesn't do any harm to administer it if it is expired. It just kind of loses some of the effectiveness, similar to like if you take an expired Benadryl or Advil, it might not be as strong, but it'll still do something. So if you have expired naloxone and that's all you've got, use it. Um, but yeah, the temperature again, above 40, you're kind of losing a little bit of effectiveness, um, but frozen and thawed a million times, you're fine. Just remember to, to thaw it before you use it or else the applicator won't work. Um, in the same vein, we had someone ask um, that they have the intramuscular naloxone. Is it okay mm -hmm. to keep it in the glove box for the same reasons? Um, I mean, yeah, like it's fine. It's the same medication. I'd have to check if the new formula is also through, I, like they've also changed it in the IM um, app, uh, ampules, um, but it would be the same, kind of the same breath. Like it's going to freeze. So you're going to have to, it might honestly be easier to thaw if you have like a little ampule that you're putting under your armpit as opposed to the huge applicator. Also, somebody asked in a class recently, again, in that same breath, don't pop these in a microwave to try to thaw them. Don't put them in boiling water. It's plastic, folks. It's going to melt. Don't do it. Someone, I understand the thought process, but stick it under your armpit, put it on the dash of your car. Um, don't like, again, extreme heat is not good for it either. Uh, Emily asked, what do you do with an expired kit and how do you dispose of it? And I'm also going to add to that, what do you do with the applicators after you've used them? Ah, yes. Okay. So expired kit, um, bring it into your pharmacy, um, give it to them. They can, especially with the 
with these bad boys. Um, they can reuse them, especially with the needles as well. Um, with these, I mean, Carly, I, <laughs> that's a question. You kind of stumped me. I used to put them in the bio bins, uh, to be honest with you, but I don't know if that's best practice. So I'm not sure if somebody's got a better answer. They could probably be, if you want to bring them into the pharmacy, be recycled. But we went through so many of them um, that we would, we would pop them in with our, like our bin pickup with the works and they would take them away. I'm sure that they recycled them, to be honest with you. Brianna was hoping you could give a uh, explanation between the difference of IM and naloxone as a whole. They didn't know that there were two different kinds of kits. Ah, yeah. Okay, for sure. Yeah. So IM um, is basically the medication that's in here. It's in an ampule and it comes with needles um, and you draw up the solution into the, I call them rigs so often, into the needle and you put it into a muscle area. And so that's like the top of the arm, the thigh. Um, and you slowly apply pressure and that is how it's administered into the body. So it's not intravenous, it's inter intramuscular. A lot of folks, there's a big misconception that this is four times stronger and therefore way more powerful. In reality, it's stronger because it has more, um, it has more to get through to get into the bloodstream. Um, and so like, I honestly, they end up kind of being the same. If you have the intramuscular, you're able, like I said, to microdose it a little bit. So folks have a little less of a withdrawal coming out of it. Um, but yeah, it's basically the exact same medicine just done in a different way. Um, and obviously the save me steps also apply other than like, you're still going to wait that two to three minutes giving CPR and then give another dose, things like that. Um, people are just more afraid to use needles for a variety of reasons, but you also want to make sure you're not, you know, injecting into the stomach, into the neck, places like that. Um, really like muscly areas, fatty areas, things like that. Hopefully that answered your question. That's great. Um, what is, again, another question for me, can you explain the difference between administering naloxone to an adult and a child? Are you, I know you briefly touched on that, but if you could go yeah, into that a little bit more. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it's a really uncomfortable thought for a lot of people to have, but it is a reality. Um, kids, youth, children can get their hands on lock or on, on opiates, variety of different ways. Um, and so, yeah, basically all the steps are the exact same. Um, like I said before, you're leaving the applicator in the nose for an additional um, 15 to 20 seconds. The reason for that is that you do want to create a bit more of a seal. Obviously, their nasal cavities are smaller. And so you want to create that seal to make sure the medication gets pushed through that blood brain barrier um, and give them the best chance of it, like actually all of it getting through. Um, apart from that, you're doing the exact same stuff. Obviously, if it's like a little baby, um, you're going to want to do your chest compressions differently. And that's more of like a CPR first aid kind of question. Um, I'm not certified to give that kind of advice, but yeah, all your steps are going to be the same. This stays in the nose for 15 to 20 seconds, just to make sure the medication gets uh, pushed through. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? You can drop them in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you have some. If you guys don't, I'm just gonna keep asking questions. So neither you're me or you can ask your own questions. Arlie, you kill me. Um, I'll pop in. Um, I missed the beginning of it, so I'm not sure. Maybe you did cover this, but um, just gonna throw it out there. Anyways, did you cover like why it's important to microdose and and how um, naloxone just kind of temporarily kicks the opiates out, but it's still there? Yeah, we, um, we touched on that okay. a little bit, that 20 to 40 minute window. Um, I kind of only briefly touched on microdosing it because honestly, that's something that unless you're comfortable with I am and you're comfortable, you know with what an opioid poisoning looks like. A lot of people don't have that level of understanding, unfortunately. Um, it is something that like, if you're, yeah, like I said, comfortable around drugs and substance use and opioid poisonings, and you just wanna get that person's breathing back to normal, I always recommend doing a little microdose of intramuscular. Um, but again, that 20 to 40 minute window <clears throat> that we did cover earlier in which the, the naloxone is blocking the receptors in the brain, but after that folks can slip into a poisoning again, for sure. 
I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my concern is, um, is the naloxone dosage the same as the same <clears throat> for children? <clears throat> if mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, it's the exact same, right? Like, especially with the nasal, there's no way to yeah. do a half dose of this. It's one spray. Um, and like I said, okay. naloxone really doesn't harm the system. It just blocks the opiate receptors in the brain. And oh, so- okay. You can give someone up to, like, you can give someone infinite <laughs> amounts of naloxone, but I believe seven doses is when it stops really doing anything in the system because it's blocked all the receptors in the brain and there's nowhere else for it to really go. Um, but yeah, like I said, it does no harm. Um, and okay. the dose would be the exact same for kids. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I have one more question. I just want to make sure, like, I know this stuff, but I just want to make sure that others do. And I, and again, I apologize for missing the getting, but um, I think it's just really important, even if you did touch it, like touching on the toxicity and the drugs and like the benzos and the difference with um, benzo overdose and opiate overdose. And when, um, if it's, if it's a combination and you're trying to reverse the overdose, when you know the naloxone uh, or opiate overdose has been reversed, and um, the sedation from the benzos, like just because somebody's not coherent doesn't mean you haven't reversed and talking doesn't mean that the opioid overdose isn't reversed. Yeah, yeah, we definitely, we touched on that in the signs awesome. and symptoms part um, in terms of like, yeah, how benzos rep repress the circulatory system and opiates repress the respiratory system and what it looks like if somebody has come out of an opioid poisoning um, but are still impacted by the benzos in their system. Um, so yeah, and this is recorded too. So if, if anybody did miss that, that section and they wanna go back and kind of hear a bit more about benzos and opiate interactions, um, definitely feel free to, but it's a really good point to bring up. E. Okay, um, I saw someone in the chat bring this up earlier. Can you clarify for us if there's a direct comparison between potency of nasal versus intramuscular or how those two compare as far as dosages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so it was really funny the other day we were on a call with um, the National Harm Reduction Coalition and there was a nurse and I had thought for my entire life that nasal was stronger than intramuscular because technically it is 10 times stronger. Um, and she had to, she schooled me left, right and center. And I was like, oh my God, I've been in the field this long. I'm the national facilitation lead and I didn't know this, how embarrassing. Um, so yeah, basically what she mentioned was that because the nasal has so much farther to go, such a thick blood brain barrier to penetrate and then to get into the bloodstream, that's why it needs to be 10 times stronger. Whereas excuse me, the intramuscular is going into the muscles directly into the bloodstream. And that's why it can be 0.4 versus four milligrams. And so, yeah, it seems like this one is 10 times stronger and people think, oh, someone's been down for, you know, an extra long time and we really got to get them back up. Let's go with, with nasal. At the end of the day, they're pretty much the exact same. Yeah. Good question. Can you tell us about how naloxone works in the brain? Like what's happening, or not naloxone, sorry, opioids. Yeah, um, like what's happening in the noodle? In the noodle, absolutely. So um, I think I said before, opiates mimic the natural happy chemicals that are released in the brain. Um, like when you achieve something, when you do a really good workout, when you fall in love, so the, the dopamine, the serotonin, all that fun stuff. Um, and so basically those receptors, they or the, the opiates, they interfere with the way the neurons are being sent and they're being received in the receptors and the neurotransmitters um, and they confuse the system and they give you that feeling of being high, right? The like nothing hurts anymore and I'm feeling like I'm floating and everything is great and I have no inhibitions. Um, but in turn, yeah, that affects the respiratory system. And so therefore it confuses the lungs and that person stops breathing. And that's actually what the poisoning is, is that person not breathing anymore. Thank you. Uh, David asked, is naloxone still effective if the heart stopped and CPR is administered? Mm, yeah, it's a really good question, right? So the, the naloxone does have to be pushed through the bloodstream to get into the brain. And so, like we said, in those complicating factors, um, 
if the heart has stopped beating and you've administered the naloxone, like it's not really going to do much. So that's why CPR is really important. That's why getting that heart, even if it's manually being done, getting that blood pumping is important again. And that might be an al also that might be a time where uh, dispatch tells you to go get a defibrillator if the heart has stopped beating. Hope that answered your question. That was David. If someone is sleeping, but still breathing, um, should we administer naloxone? Like if they're unconscious, we can't wake them up, but there's still breath. <sighs> Carly, I, I personally say no. And that's because I have a level of comfort with poisonings and with substance use that I can monitor someone's breath pretty effectively because I've done this for a very long time. And so I can watch someone breathing and make sure that they're within normal range and, you know, see that chest rise, that one breath every five seconds, cyanosis won't be there, all that kind of stuff. So I take the stance if someone's still breathing um, and, you know, they're again, cyanosis isn't happening. They're still getting oxygen to their brain, to their organs, to their blood, then do not administer naloxone. That is not to say that everyone has that level of comfort. And if you're seeing someone and they aren't responding to you, they are unconscious um, and you're really, really scared. I mean, yeah, I still say don't do it, but people act out of fear and that's okay. And if you think somebody is going under and that you're going to lose them um, and, and you give naloxone, don't count that as like a moral failing because they're still breathing. But my advice to you all is if somebody is still breathing, watch them breathe. Like I was on the subway the other day and somebody was like, like on the nod bordering consciousness, uh, all of a sudden wasn't really talking to me, but I was watching him breathing pretty, pretty attentively. And 10, 15 minutes later, he was, he was back up and he was good. So try not to act out of fear, try to act, you know, logic, remember what we talked about today. Um, and yeah, like, like we don't want someone to be in withdrawal if they don't have to. It's a very yucky feeling. Does anybody have any more questions? Is there a time frame after the drugs or substances are consumed that the poisoning will happen by? Like, are you clear after a certain point or is, can it, can it oh. happen whenever? I mean, like in terms of how quickly it can happen, it all depends on how somebody metabolizes drugs, their tolerance, all of that stuff. I mean, I would normally say, and like, this is just, the way in which I like have operated in the field and as someone with lived and experience and things that I've seen, usually after like 20, 30 minutes, you're kind of in the clear, um, at least in my experience. But yeah, if you're using drugs, use, use, use them around people, stay with somebody for as long as you can. Um, but yeah, usually that's about the, the time frame that I've seen that you're kind of in the clear. Can you spray nasal naloxone into nope. a mouth? No, I knew it before you said it. No, don't do it. It's a waste of naloxone. It's a waste of your time and energy. And it's a waste of that person tasting that for weeks to come. Um, it is a very nasty, nasty taste. Don't do it. Um, it's not going to do anything. It's, it's not going to help the situation. If it's not going through the nose, you've done that massage, you've done everything you can do CPR until EMS gets there. Or if you have intramuscular, do intramuscular, but never spray in the mouth. Good question. Um, what happens if we run out of naloxone um, while we're responding to a poisoning and that person remains unconscious? What do we do? You do CPR until EMS gets there. Yeah, like I said, back in the day, we used to just be able to give uh, oxygen. We didn't even have to give naloxone when, you know, benzos weren't as prominent. Um, and it was usually just like fentanyl and not carfentanil. We could just give oxygen and people would be reversed. Um, I've responded to poisonings without having naloxone and you just do CPR. Yeah. Until EMS gets there. Um, I don't know how to say the name of that drug. Uh, Larissa asks, what about Xylazine. Thank you. <laughs> what about xylazine? Oh God. I mean, xylazine's like relatively new. 
Um, I don't know too much about it. I'm not going to lie to you all. It's not an opiate. It's like more of like, I guess I could be wrong, Alana, if you know more, feel free to jump in, but it's more of a, like a, mus a muscle relaxant um, and like has sedative qualities um, and traditionally used in the veterinary circuit. If I, yeah, okay. Um, For the most part, yeah, and it, yeah. it is essentially just a, a layering of different types of depressants, just yeah. like a, a benzo reaction would be. So it's an additional depressant that's not an opioid that's being layered on and further um, further impacting the respiratory system mm -hmm. so that the naloxone may not be as effective as it could without the further complications. Yeah, so you would respond in the exact same way and you might see what I'm assuming is you might see more of an atypical response, an atypical poisoning response where that person is still down after the naloxone. Um, and so you would follow in that exact same way um, of just like, you know, making sure they're breathing, recovery position, following dispatch, all that kind of stuff. Sasha asked for pets, would you just squirt the nasal uh, spray near the snout if the applicator won't fit in? Oh, great question. I don't think spraying it near the snout would do anything, to be honest with you. I, I think it would have to be like, it has to pretty much get through again, like that nasal cavity, that blood brain barrier. And so just spraying around, I don't think would do much. Uh, I don't have a dog. And so I don't know how their noses work. I would say if you have intramuscular, that would be probably your best bet um, to use it in that situation um, and really try to get like as close to the, to the nose as you can in the nostril. Alana, you've, you've got dogs. What do you think? <laughs> so you'd, you'd want to use the same strategy as we would with an infant or toddler where the applicator is probably too large to fit inside the nostril. You'll notice at the end of the applicator, there's a very tiny pinpoint that the spray is administered through. So you're going to point that pinpoint um, towards the end of the snout, which is much longer than your average nose most of the time. Um, and you're going to create a seal around that nostril against the applicator tip with your fingers as much as you can while you're administering it. So the same types of preventative measures we put in place to prevent some of the medication from dripping out um, if we were administering to an infant or toddler or where the nozzle didn't fit inside the nostril properly. Create as much of a seal as possible to get as much of the medication where it needs to go as you can. Awesome. Thanks, Alana, our resident veterinarian. I love it. I don't know much about animals, as you all can tell, but Alana does. So thank you. All right. Oh, Haley, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Hi. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you so much. This presentation was just incredibly effective and your teaching style, I found very um, yeah, just relatable and it resonated. So thank you for that. Also just for context, I'm in Manitoba where there is currently a critical level of toxic drug supply as well as with, you know, a lot of pushback against, you know, government speaking for state consumption sites. So while it's kind of locks on being talked about almost as a strategy. And I suppose just with all your experience, I wondered if there was one, I mean, the whole presentation was a lot of takeaways for me, but like in somebody who's trying to sort of actively, you know, speak truth to power and sort of find effective ways to, um, yeah, cut through with a message in terms of the need or the power for safe consumption sites. And mm -hmm. so I just wondered if there was anything that really just sort of was incredibly shifting for you or, you know, mm -hmm. a message or a, yeah. So anyway, yeah. thank you. And yeah, no, thank you. It was very kind words. I appreciate it. I think the stance that I've taken in terms of advocacy, um, especially when advocating to like really big systemic government level spaces is coming in with like a one-two punch. And I hope I'm like, I hope I'm actually answering your question here, but the first one being kind of humanizing Absolutely. what's going on, okay, amazing. Um, humanizing the, the epidemic that we're facing and honestly getting the folks who know the most about what's going on, which are the peers, which are people who are using drugs, the people who started this whole fight decades ago, um, getting folks like that involved in advocacy is incredibly, incredibly valuable and important. And then bringing science to back it up, right? Like there's, I think our lead curriculum developer says for every one minute of talking, having six scholarly sources to back it up. And especially when you are um, advocating to government levels, to huge, huge um, 
like organizations, having that backing of being like, well, okay, you didn't understand the human aspect of this. Here's the science. Like you can't argue that. Um, that's been super impactful for me when I was at the shelter and trying to advocate to a board of people who were stuck like basically in the eighties um, and their feminism was like not intersectional. They didn't understand kind of the, the mass need for harm reduction. That's what I did. And I found it super impactful. Um, so I hope that's helpful. There's not really one catch all, but that's, that's kind of been my tactic. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think that the entire presentation and the way in which it was sort of done perfectly sort of into like winds and combines those two strategies and approaches. So thank you. Yeah. That's it. Awesome. it. Um, okay. Thanks so much. All right, for our last question, we have a question from Brianna and they asked, can you tell a difference between an opioid and a benzo poisoning? If naloxone doesn't work for a benzo poisoning, then would CPR be best? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, an opioid, so like Alana was saying, they're both depressants, right? So they're both gonna make you look really lethargic. They're both gonna make you look um, like have that, that unconsciousness, you might get the cyanosis as well with the, um, the benzo poisoning. And that's not because necessarily of the respiratory system failing, but again, that circulatory system is failing. And once the heart goes, everything starts to go with it. And so you're not going to get blood, let alone oxygenated blood to the extremities. Um, and so, yeah, your best bet with that is to wait for EMS. Like I said, there is an antidote for a benzo poisoning. Unfortunately, it's not widely available because you need to dose it really, really effectively. Um, and if you dose it, like if you misdose it, it can lead to a seizure or to death. Um, and so that's why medical personnel need to use it. But yeah, CPR, because that respiratory system or that circulatory system is failing. And again, you're most likely going to get EMS telling you to go get a defibrillator. Um, I had a few clients who regularly use Xanax um, and while there was fentanyl in the Xanax, most of the poisonings that we saw were benzo specifically. Um, and it was basically following that same system. Um, we used naloxone still because we weren't sure. Uh, and then, yeah, once EMS got there, they took over. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Camille. Um, we appreciate you taking today to come and join us and to answer a bunch of questions and to help us out and deliver such a wonderful training that you do so personably. We appreciate you uh, and all you do. So I am just going to relaunch our survey. So anybody that didn't have a chance to participate in it earlier can uh, do that now if they want. If you've already done it, don't worry about it. Oh, just kidding. It will erase all of my results. So I can send you one personally. Um, so if you would like to just drop it in the chat that you haven't filled it out and I will send you one. Um, with that being said, uh, keep an eye out on your email this week. If you subscribe to our newsletter, our newsletter will be coming out and that's filled with lots of uh, great guides, podcasts, tips, infographics, all sorts of information about the topics that we've covered today so that everybody has access to them. Um, this one is also going to be showcasing our brand new drug tracking system. So the accidental drug poisoning uh, crisis community of practice has a pillar that is working specifically on a drug tracking system Canada wide. So uh, harm reduction organizations and drug tracking or, or drug testing organizations can submit their information and we're going to get um, notifications in real time. So you know um, what is happening and where um, some poison drugs might be in your community at that time. Um, so again, for those of you who said yes to receiving nasal naloxone, I just want to remind you that it will be shipped out in mid-February because we are backlogged right now. And if you said no initially that you didn't want any and you change your mind and you do want some, send an email with your full mailing address to the summit at sja.ca and I can add you to the list and make sure that you get some. Um, and finally, um, I just want to say that the reason that we hold these monthly get togethers is to share ideas, to build bigger and stronger communities, and to give a platform to the voices who don't always get it so that we can learn together and learn from people who actually know what they're talking about. Uh, we value all of your thoughts, we value your stories, we value your questions, and we value your experiences, because when we listen, we can support each other better. Uh, so you can join us next month on February 22nd for our next COP, and that's where we're going to be looking at healthcare providers and harm reduction and what that relationship looks like. So as always, we thank you for sharing your time and yourselves with us. We appreciate you and all of the work that you do. We couldn't do any of this without you. Uh, so until next time, we will see you soon. <laughs>